Welcome to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson, Certified Financial Planner and Managing Director of Polaris Capital Advisors here in Hilton Head, South Carolina, and I'll be the host of the new show Money Matters on WHHI-TV, Hilton Head, Bluffton, Sun City, and I'm very much looking forward to this show. I think we have a lot of really exciting things that we can talk about. I think it's a very exciting time economically, financially, politically, and I think that there's a lot of interesting topics that we'll be able to look at from a macroeconomic level, from a financial markets level, income tax, financial planning, really discuss those, get to the meat of those topics, and bring them to you in a way that hopefully will be able to have a positive impact on your financial life, and also discuss how they're going to impact our local economy. I really think we're going to have a lot of interesting, fun things to talk about, and I certainly welcome any ideas that any of the viewers have. I certainly would welcome those. Please uh, send me an email or, uh, or call me, and I would certainly love to hear your concepts. Um, I certainly do not intend for this show to be a CNBC. That said, I do hope that we can tackle some of those economic concepts that are a little bit meatier and bring them, bring them to a local level and explain them in a way that people can actually understand and apply to their daily life. So I hope that you'll join us on a weekly basis as we cover some of these interesting topics. And uh, I look forward to seeing you, you know, again on our next show next week. But without further ado, I hope that uh, you will help me to welcome our inaugural topic of quantitative easing. I know it doesn't sound like a very exciting topic. In fact, you could call it QE2, which is more like the cruise ship, which probably does sound a little more exciting, but we're not on the travel channel today. We're on the financial network, so I, uh, that, that's the direction that we're going to be going with QE2, is talking about quantitative easing, specifically what it is, the fact that it's coming to an end, what the impact of quantitative easing has been on our markets, uh, what we expect to happen next, and how you can best position yourself going forward uh, for hopefully for a profit. In addition, we're going to have David Kroll of Mortgage Network joining us to, dis to discuss how quantitative easing is impacting interest rates, the housing market, and our local economy. So without further ado, uh, I look forward to welcoming you back to our show here in just a minute. Again, I'm Emily Johnson, and this is Money Matters, and I'll see you shortly. Welcome back to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson, and as I suggested in our introduction, we're going to be discussing today the exciting topic of quantitative easing, or QE2. It's not a cruise ship. As I said, it is a cruise ship, but it's not going to be for purposes of our show today. We really want to get to the meat of this topic. I realize that it is a meatier topic, and we are starting this program off with a meaty topic, but my objective here is to discuss something that does impact all of us on a daily basis but that typically when we, when we hear about it, it sounds like it's at a, such a macro level that we can't quite figure out how to decipher it and bring it down to our local everyday life. So what I'd like to do is first sort of have an educational segment before we introduce meatier discussions of this topic, specifically with David when we get into a QA. and a uh, Specifically, I'd like to talk about what quantitative easing is, QE2 specifically, what its impact has been, what the objectives are, and also how it impacts you on a daily basis. So initially, what is QE2 other than a cruise ship? QE2 is the Federal Reserve's second round of quantitative easing. Specifically, it's about $600 billion that the Federal Reserve took from the U.S. Treasury. They used that $600 billion to purchase Treasury bonds, which in effect flooded the, flooded the markets with cash. By taking money out of the U.S. Treasury's pocket and putting it into the U.S. consumer's pocket by buying those bonds. And then they put the bonds back in their, uh, back in their coffers and flood the market with money. In doing that, their objective is, one, to lower interest rates. Two, because they're lowering interest rates, to hopefully have consumers move money out of low interest rate or low risk investments, such as CDs, bonds, you know, other investment savings accounts, for example, that right now are you know, yielding 0.012%, 1% for two years, uh, things like that, hopefully motivate movement out of those low-risk investments into higher-risk investments, such as stocks, other equities, et cetera, and in doing so, 
motivate growth in the market. By stimulating the market, hopefully we can then stimulate jobs, uh, corporate investment in technology, et cetera. So in summary, again, the basics of QE2 are that the Federal Reserve used government dollars to then purchase treasury bonds. And when it purchases treasury bonds, it floods the market with money. Flooding the market with money is supposed to motivate risk, lower interest rates, and hopefully stimulate corporate investment uh, and also spending on the consumer's perspective. So in a nutshell, that's what QE2 was, and that's also what the Federal, Federal Reserve was intending when they decided to go ahead with QE2. Um, whether or not QE2 has been a success is definitely up, uh, up for decision, and I don't know what the history books will say at some point. But we're coming to the end of QE2 now. The $600 billion has basically been spent, and the Federal Reserve probably will not be going forward with any additional spending of Treasury dollars in the market. So the question is, has the desired impact actually occurred or not, and what does that mean to us? I, I would suggest that at the moment, the impact has been, yes, we have had somewhat of a market rally, which is what was intended. Uh, I'm not sure that it was to the degree that most people anticipated, but yes, when the market was flooded with cash, there was money that was moved out of bonds that were now yielding 1%, CDs that are yielding 1%, and moved into stocks. Some of it was, but more so, I think that there's been a greater trend of those funds being moved into commodities, and that's why you see gold at historically the highest level it's ever been, uh, oil at $100, $100 a barrel, and that's why we're seeing gas at $4 a gallon, $3.75 a gallon. So really, instead of actually having a move towards risk or a move towards businesses, investment in stocks, we've seen a greater move towards commodities and basically a commodity inflation. And what's important about that is that that actually does impact your daily life. As I said, that impacts when you're at the pump, the fact that you're now seeing $4 gas. Uh, certainly has a daily impact on you. It also is going to have an impact on what you see when you go to the grocery store and you're buying your groceries because eventually companies are going to have to start passing their costs down to the consumer. So I think that it's fair to say that what QE2 has actually done is, yes, they have successfully lowered interest rates or at least kept interest, interest rates artificially low uh, for where they need to be. Uh, but instead of necessarily spurring growth, they've actually spurred more of a commodity inflation which is now actually driving our daily cost of living up. And when you have an economy that is already relatively nervous, uh, $4 oil, when you have a 9% unemployment rate, is actually something, I'm sorry, $4 gas, when you have a 9% unemployment rate, can actually be something that uh, causes a lot more nervous attitude and a lot more volatile uh, market, or at least more of a wait and see type market. So I think that it's fair to say that there has been some success, but by and large, we're looking right now at a bit more of an inflated market, and we're just sort of in a wait and see from a financial market's perspective to see what the Federal Reserve decides to do next, and also whether or not companies can actually start growing on their own and solving our unemployment problems, hopefully without, uh, hopefully without inflation continuing. So I guess the last question that you have here is, this is not meant to be a doomsday or type show. I'm certainly the eternal optimist. And I, I think that we have a lot of ways that uh, you can actually profit from markets like this. And that's what we need to focus on. Specifically, some things that we look at right now from an investment perspective are, we definitely think that it's worth shorting the, the long-term bond market. The reason for that being, when you look at bonds, interest rates, when interest rates are low, bond prices tend to be high. And as interest rates go up, you see bond prices go down. So if you currently hold bonds and we expect that interest rates have to go up, which from here they probably do, you would also expect that those bond prices are going to go down. So one bet that we're making right now, educated, educated bet, is that we expect that the long end of uh, the bond market is probably going to decrease in value. 20, 30 year bonds are going to decrease in value. And so we've actually been selling those bonds in the form of exchange traded funds or ETFs. That's one direction that we've been taking. Another thing that you might consider looking at is the fact that oil prices are at unsustainably, we believe, high levels, especially given the uh, economic environment that we have right now. So we've actually been betting against oil prices as well. Um, and there's other ways that you could, you could do this with individual companies or with exchange traded funds. Obviously, that's, uh, that seems to be the uh, method du jour these days, and we'll get into that in another show. But those are two ways that you might actually consider positioning yourself, positioning your portfolio to profit from what's going on in the market right now, and specifically the end of quantitative easing. So I hope that that's been somewhat educational, um, informative, 
and I don't know if it'll be entertaining or not, but uh, I certainly hope that uh, it's been beneficial. And in our next segment, what we're going to do is introduce David Kroll, uh, who is the Managing Director of Mortgage Network here and throughout the Southeast, to discuss more how quantitative easing is impacting interest rates, uh, housing, as housing is typically one of the largest assets in any individual family's uh, asset list and also uh, how it's impacting our local economy. So please join us again in just a minute back on Money Matters to uh, discuss these issues with David Kroll. Thank you very much. Welcome back to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson, and I'm joined with, by David Kroll of Mortgage Network, who is here to discuss further with us the impact of quantitative easing QE2, specifically on interest rates, the real estate market, our local market. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So a uh, couple of questions here. You've listened to my monologue, I guess, over the last couple uh -huh. of minutes here. Uh -huh. So what do you think the impact has been of QE2, specifically on interest rates, the mortgage market? QE2. Uh, one of its fundamental objectives was to drive interest rates down and hold them there. And it certainly accomplished that objective. Uh, as you spoke eloquently, one of the other uh, objectives of QE2 was to spur, spur economic activity, to spur growth. And so far, it has not done that. Um, the uh, homeowners have not come back into the market. So interest rates have gone down, people have refinanced, but it has not spurred uh, growth in housing. Mm -hmm. Corporations have uh, refinanced their debt. Uh, some of the, our strongest corporations in the United States have refinanced their debt at one and a quarter, one and a half percent, and have simply uh, pocketed the money. In other words, have mm -hmm. restructured their balance sheets and, uh, and said, thank you very much, that's enough. But it Specifically has, banks, or are you seeing other? Uh, well, certainly the banks are borrowing uh, at virtually zero, mm -hmm. but um, I know that uh, uh, Warren Buffett's company recently refinanced about $10 billion worth of debt at 1.5%, wow. and has no major growth plans. So um, the, the QE2, QE2 absolutely drove interest rates down but for the moment has not spurred activity. Mm -hmm. And so you feel that the interest rates are basically artificially low based on the, the risk that still remains in the market? They are, they are lower than they would have been, but not a great deal lower. The, the interesting thing is, uh, and this is really a quandary that, that experts are scratching their heads about right now, markets are anticipatory. So whatever we're looking at and whatever we're seeing in the market today, the traders have already anticipated. So the traders are very smart, and they know that QE2 is going to be gone, mm -hmm. over. Uh, in other words, no new purchases of mortgage-backed securities, no new purchases uh, by the Fed of, uh, of treasuries. They know that this is going to be over in June, and yet rates are very low. In mm -hmm. fact, they've come down in the last couple of weeks even further. What that says is that without QE2, we're still going to have low rates. Okay, that's um, interesting. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real head scratcher. How long do you think those low interest rates will remain? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but based on what you can see and what, what factors would drive that time frame? Rates are driven by one factor and one factor only, and that's inflation. And uh, uh, we don't see any inflation at the moment. Uh, uh, folks in your industry and you would you would be you're watching it like hawks as well. Um, uh, inflation will come to us when our economy improves. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I say to my folks and in, in, and to my clients in, in mortgage banking is to be careful what you wish for. Everybody is very very happy to see low rates, and I I get calls. Uh, I had a call this morning, somebody upset that they had missed out on a 4.5% fixed rate mortgage 
and are having to accept a 4.6% fixed rate mortgage. Um, be careful what you wish for. Right. This person also has a $1 million portfolio. If rates miraculously were up over the next two years to 7%, mm -hmm. that probably means their portfolio would be up to a million and a half dollars. Mm -hmm. What would you rather have? A hundred dollar a month savings on your mortgage or a half a million dollar increase right. in your portfolio? Good point. So r rate, rates are affected by inflation. Inflation is caused by economic growth. And it's economic growth that we really want. I would have to agree with that. So what, what are you recommending to your mortgage clients right now when it comes to refinancing and purchasing, whether it be for residential or also for investment? Uh, that's a great question. And uh, there are two clear answers, and they're very different from each other. To, to, the, to the folks who are lucky enough to be purchasers in this market, mm -hmm. the answer is, you should have done it yesterday. Why are you not doing it today? Um, what we all, you know, those of us that follow financial markets and those of us that, that uh, hope to, to, to take smart financial action, what we always wish we did was to buy when the market was at a low right. and to sell when the market was at a high. Whether it's a share of IBM stock or whether it's a, a condo we had, we always wish we had done something different. Mm -hmm. This is one of those moments for purchases. The entire mass of humanity are out of the real estate market. The real estate market is 30 to 40 percent off. Interest rates are 30 to 40 percent off. The cost today is, to put it simply, if 100 minus 30 percent is 70, and the cost of the money is 30 percent off, multiply that in, that's 49. Mm -hmm. The cost of, of purchase today is approximately half what it was at the height of the boom. Mm -hmm. Everybody was buying at the height of the boom. Nobody's buying at the low, and yet it's half price. So to it's purchase, a sale. it's <laughs> so it's one of those moments when you should be acting, and it's one of those moments that you will wish that you had acted. But don't you think one of the reasons people aren't acting is because mortgage underwriting standards have become so much more strict, and perhaps the cash isn't there to actually meet those underwriting standards? And do you feel that that's that's the case at all? Or? Um, that I'd like to um, I'd like to kill that rumor. Okay, um, let's do it. The the <laughs> the um, the mortgage standards, the mortgage underwriting standards are ten times more annoying. They are ten times more detailed, but they are not actually stricter. In other words, today we we have fewer declines in our purchase uh, applications than we had three years ago. Uh, we're getting the job done virtually every time. It's just that the process is very much more annoying than it used to be because every dot, uh, I needs to be dotted, every T needs to be crossed. That translates out into the community as getting the money is hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard, but you get it. Mm -hmm. Um, so who are you seeing buying right now? I know before the show when we were talking you said that you saw that, that tourists are actually definitely in the market now and looking at those second homes. Is that driving our local real estate market or are you seeing primary residences too? This, the, our local market is a reflection of the economy as a whole. There's an enormous lack of confidence, lack of, lack of consumer confidence uh, and fear still in the market. There's huge pressure for people to buy because people are reaching retirement age and this is a wonderful place to buy. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing lots and lots of lookers and fewer uh, people pulling the trigger than we would expect um, due to overall lack of confidence. The messages that they get in the press and on television are uh, fear-driven messages. That's for sure. So it's hard to make big decisions. Well, thank you very much. I think so. In, in summary, I think it's fair to say that you feel like now is an opportune time to be looking at real estate, and that while it might take uh, a little bit more time in the underwriting process, this is it's a, a very opportune time. We'll kick ourselves if we miss it. We'll kick ourselves if we miss it. This is the time. Secondly, yes, it'll be a little bit more painful. Mm -hmm. And third, you need some courage. 
All right. Thank you very much for joining us today on this inaugural Money Matters on WHHI. Again, my name is Emily Johnson. I've been joined today by David Kroll. I hope that uh, you will certainly be back to join us again next week on Money Matters with WHHI. Have a great week. Thank you.